Hey, Pittsburgh, it's Megan with a fun event for you. The Steel City Beer Fest is coming to the Monroeville Convention Center. The Beer Fest is Saturday, February 24th, and there are two sessions, 5 to 8 p.m. for the happy hour crowd and 9 to midnight for you boozy night owls. Session tickets are $40 each and come with a cute little six-ounce glass for sampling. Plus, you can snag a designated driver ticket in advance for half the price. They'll have over 40 beers to taste, plus live music from the band Walk of Shame and games like Cornhole and Putt-Putt. So don't miss out. That's the Steel City Beer Fest. Tickets at SteelCityBeerFest.com. Today on CityCast Pittsburgh, the findings are in. We know exactly why the Fern Hollow Bridge collapsed back in 2022. And unfortunately, who's at fault? The zoo closed for a day this week, quote, out of respect for recent animal deaths. And presidential election season is heating up in Pittsburgh. We're talking about what, if anything, it matters to have so many national political leaders darken our city's door. It's February 23rd, the Friday News Roundup. I'm Megan Harris, and here's what Pittsburgh's talking about. I'm with CityCast producers Sophia Lowe. Hey there. And Mary Lee Williams. Hi, Megan. Hi. Uh, Did Jins see the big news this week? Of course, totally unexpected. Can't imagine it would ever be said. Uh, A finding from a very important news source called Solitaire. No. (laughs) You said that we would know about this. You wanted to surprise us, but we would know. And I don't know what's happening. You have seen this headline, but I think who uh, came up with it is almost funnier than their actual finding. Um, So this company called Solitaire that cares very deeply about the card game solitaire they make like phone apps and stuff uh they asked their users where they play their games the most and they said uh the grocery store line was like the number one answer for where they play this stuff so they decided to analyze google reviews from three thousand individual grocery stores across a hundred cities to oh my figure God. out which stores stand out most in customer service food quality price and the speed of their checkout <laughs> oh. lines. Oh. You now you know where this is going. I the think number I one did see this. worst yeah. grocery store in the nation is here in Pittsburgh. It, Sophia, it, are you following us yes, now? Yes, yes. No, now I know what's happening. <laughs> Giant Eagle is the worst grocery store overall in the entire US according to this very important company called Solitaire. It's the one uh in the north side, uh Cedar Avenue. I I was like so lost, Megan, when you started <laughs> this story because I saw the headline. But I, I did didn't. too. But almost nobody reported like who was the one who came up with this. And I think it's hilarious that it was a solitaire phone app company that That's, decided to crunch these numbers. I also would have not guessed people play the game in the grocery store line. I was thinking bathroom. <laughs> Well, let's move on to um, some bigger news this week. Uh, Sophia, what have you been following? Uh, The collapse of the Fern Hollow Bridge. We know what happened now. Yes, yes. Uh, In Frick Park. um, That actually happened a few days after this podcast launched in January 2022. Uh, So that timing was super fun. Um, Luckily, no one died, um, but there were a few cars on the bridge, uh, including infamously that bright red Pat bus um, or PRT now. Uh, Of course, it's not all jokes, though. People were injured. Um, It could have been a lot worse, but mostly it was just a meme. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I I feel like everybody got that, like, bridge bus crane ornament. Mm -hmm. Like, I just like or they got mugs or they got T-shirts that that image is just like. It is infamous. So but like anyway, back to the actual bridge. It did reopen in July this past year. And this week we got an official report about what happened. And poor Sophia, (laughs) uh, you volunteered to watch the entire 
live stream about the findings from the National Transportation Safety Board. I just want to say I am so sorry. I had no idea how long it would be. (laughs) I know we expected this to be about an hour. But yes, I am here to report back what I learned from that board meeting, uh, which ended up being like three and a half ish, four hours long. Not It was that that. long. I knew you were offline for a while. I didn't realize that was where you were. (laughs) Um, To all the reporters who turned around stories like immediately, great job getting all like the details from the engineering jargon and thank you for doing that fast because I probably fact checked myself with those stories. <laughs> um, but like the actual contents of the board meeting in Fern Hollow, um, it was really scary to learn about how many problems were flagged throughout inspections over the years um, before that collapse in 2022. The one thing I remember coming up a lot, Sophia, was corrosion. Um, but I know that's not the only thing that went wrong. Yeah, I mean, the corrosion on the bridge was really bad, and um, that corrosion was one of the reasons that led to that collapse. Uh, The meeting started off with uh, Chairperson Jennifer Homendy saying that based on all the bridge inspections that had been done, the Fern Hollow Bridge just shouldn't have been open at all. Like, this collapse should have really been prevented. Yeah, we had that in the newsletter earlier this week. You may have seen uh, the list was long of problems with Fern Hollow. Mm -hmm. People presented all kinds of findings from their investigations of the collapse. So um, a little bit more about the corrosion. Basically, this happened because drains on the bridge weren't getting cleared out like really well or regularly. So water got places where water shouldn't go. And uh, that corroded the bridge. And there were also fully holes in the bridge. Like I saw a photo of one of those way back when it was like rusted through and you could see like daylight through it. Oh, God. Exactly. Um, That terrifying. Did not like that photo. Um, And then another issue was that the bridge wasn't really evaluated properly for how much weight it could carry. Uh, So on the day of the collapse, one of the bridge legs just gave out. Um, For people who are interested in like diagrams and more details, that kind of thing, um, part of this board meeting included an animation about the bridge collapse uh, with a lot of information about the structure and the legs. It's also available on YouTube for anyone to watch. Yes. Sophia, you sent this to us in advance and I looked through it and I'm desperately disappointed that it does not include a recreation. It's less eventful of a of an animation that I expected. It it does have some like intriguing parts for people that do want to see it. My suggestion is to fast forward to the part when they use the bus cameras. That looks like something that's like from like a post apocalyptic video game. It is also like, you know, this happened very early in the morning in the winter when it was dark. So yeah, it does look creepy. The better to see the bus with and all the photos after the fact. Yeah. Um, you said there had been inspections. I, how often do they inspect the bridges over there? Well, the bridges are supposed to be inspected every two years, and that was what was happening with Fern Hollow. And then starting in 2014, PennDOT said the bridge needed to be inspected once a year. So those inspections were happening. Okay, but inspections are only useful if people, first of all, in power, take them seriously and address yes. what yep. they find. But it also assumes that inspections themselves are like happening well like like they're done correctly and you know the findings are are accurate right there's a lot of layers to this collapse and a lot of places in the process where things could have been addressed better charlie wolfson from public source did a really good job of breaking it down and basically inspectors and engineers messed up big time when it came to figuring out the thickness of the asphalt on the bridge and how much weight the bridge could hold like i said one of the um issues was that it wasn't really evaluated properly for like carrying limits When you mean like thickness of the asphalt, you mean like they literally just didn't measure correctly how thick the bridge was right there? Yeah. So they assumed that the asphalt was thinner than it actually was. Um, And because the asphalt is thick, that means like the bridge is heavier. Oh. So how off were they? When the bridge collapsed, the weight limit was 26 tons and it really should have been three tons. Oof. Uh, That's yeah. such a big difference. And that would have been a factor in closing the bridge down. Yeah, maybe. I would I would think so. Um, th- this kind of reminds me of what happened with another bridge in that part of town, um, the Greenfield Bridge. I think this was before both of your times. Um, it's just outside Shenley Park. It's really nice and new now. Um, it goes over the parkway, if you've seen it. Um, 
it links Squirrel Hill and Greenfield, but it got closed down too for a little while um, to cars, I think first for cars and then eventually completely so that they could accommodate repairs. Um, But it was the one that everyone made fun of for so long because Pittsburgh built a bridge under a bridge to protect cars on the parkway from all of the falling debris that would come down. I sent y'all a picture. (laughs) That's such a silly little solution. <laughs> I love it. It's it's terrible. We were getting made fun of, like, literally nationally. I remember watching John Oliver and being like, oh, no, not you too. <laughs> and it's not just Philadelphia. Look at Pittsburgh, the city of bridges, and its solution to one that was dangerously deteriorating. One of these arch bridges actually has a structure built under it to catch falling deck. See that structure underneath it? They actually built that to catch any of the falling concrete so it wouldn't hit traffic underneath it. They built a bridge under the bridge. I I honestly, I love it. Props to the person that came up with that. They're hilarious. <laughs> 10 out of 10, no notes. <laughs> for Fern Hollow, though, were there ever um, repairs for any of the stuff that they identified? Like, was it at least on someone's list to get started? Did they try to address some of it? Um, with, like, weight, nothing as far as I know. Um, some cables were added to the bridge in uh, 2009 for extra support, and it sounds like that was supposed to be, like, a temporary solution. Um, and there were recommendations that uh, some sort of, like, paint coating or other type of coating could have been put on the bridge to prevent more corrosion, but that fully never happened. Ooh, man. Dang. The You know, the quote I feel like I saw everywhere this week um, I, I, Sophia, you scolded me previously because I used the word blame, but it sounded like they were blaming the city and PennDOT and the Federal Highway Administration. I, I don't actually know who owns this bridge. It's hard to keep up in Pittsburgh because roadways are owned by so many different people. I'm sure I've read it. I just forgot. Yeah. So the Fern Hollow Bridge was owned by the city of Pittsburgh um, in the board meeting. Yeah, they were saying they weren't trying to put the blame on anyone. It was supposed to be like figuring out what happened and making sure it didn't happen again. But yeah, I think that is a question on people's minds. It kind of felt like it kind of felt like some finger pointing to me personally. <laughs> I, I I do appreciate that they're like, we do need to find solutions though, because their whole purpose is like, this is we cannot have this happen again. Yeah. 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 We're incredibly lucky that it wasn't worse than it was. And I think it's worth saying, too, for folks who are new to the city or maybe new to this show, um, all a, a lot of those inspections or the when they started doing them more regularly in 2014, uh, Sophia, like that all would have happened under the previous mayoral administration. Um, Bill Peduto, if you've heard that name bandied about, uh, Mayor Ed Ganey, actually, like this was what, three or four weeks after he was inaugurated, the bridge fell down. Like what an, a spectacular way to start your mayoral administration truly yeah um and again the uh, board was pretty plain that if the city had taken action earlier the bridge would have not collapsed yeah yeah but i i, I do think that we should note that it kind of seems like or at least like from my perception that the Fern Hollow was kind of like a wake up call, I guess. Ed Blazina with the Pittsburgh Union Progress wrote a story about the ways the city has improved safety since the collapse and Mm -hmm. that it's been under Mayor Ed Ganey. um, But the PUP reports we've done more evaluations of bridges and we've hired more maintenance workers. So there there is like stuff happening yeah, well, I mean, we've seen so many stories about all the other structurally deficient or poorly rated bridges in our area. Like, I'm glad we're hiring for that, but I wonder, like, what's the right number? Like, do we have enough? Yeah, I don't know if there's, like, an exact number of people we need or anything, but there was a long list of recommendations that the board voted on. Um, and these are recommendations for the Federal Highway Administration, PennDOT, and the city. Um, so I think this is kind of a wake-up call for bridge maintenance in general. Uh, the TRIB did a really good job of putting together a summary of the recommendations, so we'll link that in the show notes. Um, but in terms of the city, like one thing they're supposed to do is create a system to document like paving records. So you know, that should address any oversights about like a bridge's thickness. And PennDOT (laughs) is going to be taking a look at the changes the city is making to improve bridge safety. Um, So that's going to be something that's continuing. Yeah. And I I again want to apologize that this like ate up half of your day. (laughs) What day this week? Uh, before we uh, move on, Sophia, any final takeaways for you since you're the newest mem- newest Pittsburgher, I guess, on the call today? 
personal takeaway is that I am not meant to be an engineer. All the technical bridge talk at the meeting was confusing to me. Um, as someone who doesn't drive, I don't think about the roads too often. I just kind of get in the vehicle and then I'm out of place. Now I'm going to be more scared crossing bridges. <laughs> um, but yeah, in terms of like any final steps, the um board announced all these findings and the probable cause of the bridge collapse, but they're not completely done yet. They're going to release like a full report in the coming weeks. Mary Lee, what have you been watching this week? Yeah, so Vice President Kamala Harris came to town this week to talk about water, everybody's uh, favorite topic. (laughs) (laughs) And I know we talked a little bit about Pete Buttigieg coming to talk about flooding. Uh, Kamala Harris was here to talk about our drinking water. This still completely floors me. Like, I know our water is better now, and I am very grateful for that, but it still kind of feels like whiplash after close to a decade of boil water advisories and, like, all these conversations about replacing lead pipes. Mary Lee, I know you've, like, had to deal with this, like, yes. quite a lot in your personal yes. life. Yes, LOL. Oh, no. Um, I had to look it up, actually, because I couldn't remember the timeline anymore. So PWSA, the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority, started reporting issues with our drinking water due to all those old lead pipes um, in 2014. And then by 2016, it felt like everyone was talking about this because our levels of contamination were almost one and a half times over what's allowed. Yikes. So the federal government like set safety limits on all of this stuff. Um, and I'm glad because like... I, I don't I it makes me worry like maybe we wouldn't have known if there hadn't been a federal limit like this to benchmark ourselves by. Yeah. And with those numbers, like we continue to be like out of compliance or over the limit until about 2020. And PWSA has been replacing a ton of public service lines, about mm-hmm. 11,000 so far, and they still have about 6,000 left to go. And so Harris came to Pittsburgh this week to announce that they're dedicating $5.8 billion, and that is billion with a B, of funding towards lead pipe removal and clean water projects across the country. And nearly $200 million of those dollars, they're earmarked for Pennsylvania. And then some of that portion, obviously, will be coming to Pittsburgh. That's a real trickle-down effect. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> Big billions of dollars, $200 million, and Pittsburgh gets a little. Better than nothing, um... I did a quick search because I was curious, like, who decided to give us this money Um, or like the trickle down bit of money. And it (laughs) seems like this was part of the bipartisan infrastructure law. And that got passed in late 2021. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm glad it's always nice to get federal money for a municipal problem. Um, better late than never. Uh, but the Trib reports that PWSA already has a nice little wish list for it. Um, so they want to replace a thousand public pipes and a thousand private service lines in Pittsburgh and in Millvale. So that's fun. And all of this is great. It's it's very good news, but it's also like definitely political. So like yes. if we just tally the visits lately. Like we had the transportation secretary, Pete Buttigieg. We had the treasury secretary, Janet Yellen, and then Biden, who came through Pittsburgh, going to East Palestine. And now we have the vice president. I mean, like it makes sense because Pennsylvania is a swing state. And according to recent polling from Emerson College in the Hill, uh, Trump is barely leading here. So it makes sense that the Biden administration uh, and that whole team would be more present here leading up to the election in November. Maybe I'm being too hopeful here, but I actually don't think our election season is going to be too nuts. Like 2016 was. <laughs> OK. I know. I know. <laughs> OK. It was, but it, but it was it was wild because both parties were still choosing a candidate. Like that's not going to be a thing this year. Biden's an incumbent. And unless the courts decide otherwise, the Republicans are going to have Trump. So like they'll still have to make themselves known in Western Pennsylvania. But I don't I don't think it's going to be quite the circus it was two cycles ago. Megan, I am already sweating for this upcoming election cycle. I guess we're in it already. But like as somebody from the deep south where elections were basically like a shoe in for certain candidates, I'm just like not used to all of this like political attention, like the TV ads, the YouTube ads. I mean, like, you just like you are trapped in it. 
during this Up time. Your ad block game. <laughs> That's true. Sophia is <laughs> schooling us on how to like set up our ad block. I don't have cable. I don't get ads. <laughs> I don't either, but I have so many like random streaming services and the ads do get taken over this time of year. Uh, but y'all do have a slight upside because you don't watch sports. That's true. And I feel like hockey and pirates games are the worst for political ads. Well, like ads aside, back to the water, no matter the reasons that political uh, officials are making their way down here, we are still getting the funding and things are doing pretty good right now in terms of our water. So all good news. It, it is good news. And earlier this month, PWSA said we're still at a historic low for like lead and contaminants. And Harris said we're on track to get all the lead pipes replaced in the next few years. Although I did think it's funny, though, because PWSA heard that and they sort of were like, that's the goal and we'll probably come very close to achieving it. So I just thought that like was a little funny. (laughs) It's very pragmatic. It's a winning spirit. Like, I appreciate it. (laughs) And one thing I want to throw out there, if anyone is now worried that they might have lead in their pipes, if you're a PWSA customer, you can get a free lead testing kit. I got one of these a few weeks ago. It's super easy. You just need to, like, fill up a bottle of water and send it back with a quick form that they also send to you. And if you do have high levels of lead in your water, you'll get a free water filter to get rid of that lead. So your water's safe to drink. Okay. uh, Last up, Megan, what have you been following? Mine's a little bit of a womp womp. Um, a bunch of yins may have seen this already, but uh, last weekend on Saturday, the Pittsburgh Zoo closed to mourn its lost animals. Did y'all see that? Oh, yeah, I heard yeah. about that. One was a baby elephant. Not the mm-hmm. babies. Suni, uh, she died on February 15th. She was two years old and she lived at the International Conservation Center. So it's the ICC. Um, it's a zoo property in Somerset. She was so cute. Yeah. And it's really sad because she like she died of a virus. Mm-hmm. Um, please excuse my pronunciation. It's elephant endotheliotropic herpes virus or EEHV. Um, So according to a release from the zoo, uh, younger elephants are apparently at higher risk for this virus. Um, The older ones like develop antibodies, but the young ones have a really high mortality rate. It's 85 percent. Yeah, I mean, I hear virus and I'm thinking, eek, something's contagious. So like, are the other elephants at the facility okay? I mean, the older ones, yes, Um, but it's always a fear for the babies. Um, I feel like a lot of people don't know this. So SUNY and most of the elephants under the care of the Pittsburgh Zoo and Aquarium, they don't actually live here in Pittsburgh. They're mostly in that facility in Somerset. Um, They describe it as a premier research, education, breeding and training facility. But I think this is like worth bringing back up because it's also been sort of a sore spot in recent years because neither the center nor the zoo are accredited anymore through like one of the nation's main groups for that. It's called the AZ. So we were members for 29 years, um, but then we forfeited our membership in 2015 for what zoo officials at the time called philosophical differences in the care and maintenance of the animals. Um, But the AZA said that the Pittsburgh Zoo, quote, decided their status quo was preferable to complying with the AZA's more rigorous occupational safety standards related to caring for elephants, which it was a very short press release, but it was very scathing, I thought. Woof. Yeah. But I I do want to know, we have other accreditations, though, like every professional org has accreditations. And so glancing at the website right now, they list the ZAA, the Alliance of Marine Mammal Parks and American Humane. So there are accreditations at the zoo. Yes. Yeah. But the AZA is a really important one because it's related to the lease that the zoo has with the city of Pittsburgh. So they're allowed to be on city property in Highland Park. And without that accreditation in good standing, technically, the city could evict the zoo. Um, It was a huge story a couple years ago. Where would all the animals go? I mean, it would be political, like a political nightmare. You don't want to evict the zoo. You want the zoo to get their house right so that everything's fine. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Um, So since then, uh, they do have a new CEO in the midst of all of this. um, And he has said that they are back on a pathway to accreditation, um, but that it takes time to like jump through all these hoops and that the AZA board itself like only meets every so often to even consider their application. Um, But I haven't heard in months like they said they were going to get it squared away last year in 2023. Um, But I haven't heard whether we A, actually applied, B, 
B, if we did apply, where the application is in the process. Um, the AZA's website does not have us listed right now, so I assume we have not made it back into the fold. Um, but anyway, all of this goes back to the elephants and how Pittsburgh was taking care of them and taking care of their own people. So I kind of think it's not a great look to have another baby elephant die in their care, even no. for something that maybe they can't control, like a virus. Um, it's just it's all really sad, and I hope they get it figured out. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, the zoo seems to be having a pretty bad run with animal deaths recently, like their sea lion named Seahawk. He was also called Hawk. He died and he was 18 years old. Yeah, yeah. And then one of their gorillas died earlier this month, Marithi. Uh, Marithi was 31 years old. Yeah, and there was another animal death. Uh, This was a little uh, while ago. This was in July, but this one made me sad because it was a red panda. His name was Kovu, and the zoo's press release said he was Mr. Cool. I love red pandas, and I brought proof. Aww. Oh my God. Multiple red pandas. This one's a little crochet one, and I think I bought this one from the Smithsonian Zoo. Aww. Um, And just to close out with some happier animal news, did y'all see the horse galloping down I-95? This was on the other side of the state by Philly. No. I have not seen this video. I did not see it. Um, Okay, I'm going to slack this to you real quick. Look at him go. Wow. He looks so majestic and it's on the highway instead of a field, but. I really hope that it's okay for his hooves. Her hooves? I don't I, know. I don't know. I sometimes I forget what horses look like when they run and then I see it and I'm like, damn, that's cool. Horses so powerful. are terrifying creatures. Um, but the Philadelphia Inquirer reported that the stallion came from the Fletcher Street Urban Riding Club. Um, and the riding club thinks that the horse was intentionally let loose. Oh bad. no. Um, But the good part is that the riding club and the police caught the horse, so I assume it's safely back. Um, So no horse is hurt on the highway. Oh, good. Gosh. Uh, Okay, yeah, let's wrap this up for today. Uh, Where might folks spot a city caster this weekend? Where are you going to be? Yes, I am going to go to a drag brunch at Aslan Beer in the Strip. Uh, I'm actually going because I went to the drag bingo at Trace and my team won a bingo and we got a free Ooh. ticket to another event. So it's like part two. That's fine. Yeah, I'm excited. That'll be good. But aside from that, I will be in my home. So you will not see me unless you are in my house. <laughs> I've got a lot of things on my list for Saturday, and we'll see how many of these things I uh, hit up. There's a lion dance at Squirrel Hill uh, at 2.30, and then Jaded's doing a Lunar New Year open house with, like, a vegan potluck, t-share, poetry, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, That's from 4.30 to 7.30 in Oakland. And the last thing is a vintage disco night at Belvedere's in Lawrenceville. Busy. Sophia, if you really, like, hit a hat trick on going out of your house, I'm going to be so impressed. (laughs) That is so much. I am so... You got to text us and let us know. How many you make it to? I will. Um, And then Sunday, zero plans. Uh, so I, uh, it's my partner's birthday this weekend. Oh, actually. happy birthday. Um, I know. So we're going to have a little family dinner. Um, but I am also considering the Flamingo Fest at the National Aviary, which is AZA accredited, by the way. Um, I personally have a weird relationship with birds, but the festival is pretty cheap, runs all weekend and includes a whole lot of pink, which honestly <laughs> helps my mental game with birds a lot. The pink like just kind of diffuses my anxiety. Are you scared of birds? Because the aviary has them flying around. That is not the place to be. They, I'm not afraid of them. They just, they put me, they make me a little tense. And this is like immersive therapy. I'm trying to get better. I, I believe in you. I think the aviary Good is luck. a great place for it. The birds are so wonderful. The aviary itself is wonderful. Very happy to support them. That's all for today here on CityCast Pittsburgh. Please check out our website if you haven't already. It's pittsburgh.citycast.fm and it's full of all of our past shows and lots of the great stuff that Francesca writes for the Hey Pittsburgh newsletter. Our music is by Benji. Mary Lee Williams is our executive producer. Sophia Lowe and Elizabeth Kama produce the show. Francesca DeBecco writes our newsletter. And I'm your host, Megan Harris. We'll be back next week with the county executive. Have a great weekend, everyone.
Okay, well, since y'all are Googling, I need to go remove my cats who are having a war outside of my closet right now. (laughs) Okay. 